the time. Wanted to, once again, I thank you every Sunday for being here, and I know that you probably think, well, why is he thanking us for being at church? Because there are so many places you could have chosen to be. Um, you could have chosen to stay home and in bed. Um, you could have chosen to go hunting, fishing, whatever. But you chose rather to come to the house of the Lord this morning. And that tells me that whether you came out of obligation or whether you came out of expectation, you came knowing that you were going to hear something from the Lord. Amen? If you've got your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and open to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And I wanted to explain in just a minute, because the past few weeks, if you haven't been here, you'll hear it now. And if you have been here, you've heard me say it. And in this new year, I have asked our church to choose a time of fasting and prayer. Um, I posted a video on Facebook just explaining my heart about that. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may have not. And my whole purpose in calling us to a corporate fast and prayer is that fasting and prayer does something that just normal, routine Christianity does not. Because fasting requires a sacrifice. Whether it's fasting of food, whether it's fasting of social media, whether it's fasting of just sweets, bread, whatever. Whatever you give up to get more of God, he will honor. And as I have been fasting and praying in my own life, I have already seen things in the word that I have not seen before. Already this morning, I have an expectation. I have a stirring within me, and I hope some of you feel the same. Because I already know in my spirit, 2020 will not be a year that will just be, well, it was another year. It's going to be a year that will continually be talked about for ages to come. I believe that with all of my heart. And as I was praying and as I was fasting, as I was asking the Lord, what would you have me to preach? What would you have me to start off the new year with? I heard it just as clear as day about two weeks before Christmas. And the title came to me, it was called The Conditions of Revival. Now, <coughs> Misty, and Tyler shook my fist, but don't lie. When Tyler was at home, teenager, whatever, did you have certain conditions and requirements he had to meet if he wanted to go hang out with friends, bar the car, go hunt, fish, and whatever? Did he have certain conditions, like certain chores or anything he had to do before he could leave? He had to hang, so well, see, you got all these. <laughs> Paul. Any of your kids, if they want to go spend the night in with you, have certain things they've got to do before they can go. Certain conditions, certain rules and stuff. Right. Your children, little, just a little bit, just, just a tiny bit. Sheila. And then all your kids sitting right there, they're doing something, uh huh? Absolutely. <laughs> For me, if I wanted to do anything, it didn't matter if I wanted to drive the car to Walmart. My mother said, you've got to clean the house. Not my room, the house. Because she knew my room was pretty spotless. I'm a little OCD when it comes to my personal space. But the rest of the house, I could care less about. But that's what I had to do. And that included deep cleaning the kitchen, deep cleaning the bathroom, doing the laundry. I mean, it included a lot of things. And that instilled an ethic in me that meant if I wanted something, that required me to put in some work. If I wanted to do something that benefited me, if I wanted to do something that I knew in the long run was something I really desired to do, if I really wanted to do it, I would do it, no questions asked. No conditions on my part. I'll do whatever because you set a rule. Because if, if I don't meet this rule, I can't go. It's interesting, as I was praying and I was thinking about this, how we have such a, a misconception about God. We think that God is just totally unconditional. We think that God has no conditions, no requirements, nothing set out for his people. That once we accept Jesus into our heart, that's it. We just float around, we just, we just go about our business, and that's it. But can I tell you, God is not totally unconditional. If you don't know what a condition is, if you've ever bought a car, or you've, or you've got an iPhone, or you've bought a house, you sign a contract of terms and conditions. And a condition is a state of affairs that must exist or be brought about before something else is possible or permitted. It's a requirement that must be met. A condition is a qualification that is placed on obligation, meaning that fulfillment of the agreement will only be rendered when and if certain criteria 
criteria is met. If you show up to your job tomorrow and you just sit there and stare at the wall and that's all you do for the next two weeks, do you really think your boss is going to be happy about paying you for work you did not do? You won't show up to work and not put in work to get your paycheck, but why do we show up to church and not put in the necessary work and expect God to move? Thought it would be quiet this morning. That's okay. Amen. See, the greatest misconception is that everything about God is unconditional. But the only two things about God that are unconditional are his love and his promises. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It required nothing on our part for him to send Jesus. He did it unconditionally. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. 2 Corinthians 1, 20 says, For all of God's promises are yes in Christ. You go back to Genesis chapter 12, when God is talking to Abraham, he says, I will make your, your descendants as the sand of the sea and as the stars of the sky, and I will give them this land, and you see no conditions attached to the promise. God gave Abraham this promise with no conditions on Abraham's part. He didn't say you had to go do this and do that before. He said, this is what I'm going to do, point blank, period. I have said it, and it will be so. But everything else about God is conditional. Don't believe me? Let me list off a few. Salvation is conditional. Romans 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died and was raised from the dead, then you shall be saved. Answered prayers are conditional. You read in Matthew 21, 22 that says if you believe, then you will receive what you have asked. Forgiveness is conditional. Matthew 6 and verse 14 and 15 says that if you forgive others their trespasses, then your Father in heaven will forgive you of your trespasses. But if you do not forgive them, you will not be forgiven. Wisdom is even conditional. Proverbs 2 tells us that if we seek after understanding and wisdom, then we shall attain it. All throughout Scripture, you will see God presenting if-then conditions, if-then statements. Everywhere, I mean, it, it is just full of if-then promises, if-then conditions. But we think that God just, we're going to be able to just stand here and God just pour it out on us. That we can come to church every Sunday, sit on our favorite pew, Shake hands with our friends, say hello, do our normal routine, and expect God to do something new when we're still living in the old. Hello. Everything God has set forth in Scripture, everything that He has ever said to us as individuals, was a conditional statement. All of these if-then conditions are always addressed to the people. The ifs are never addressed to God. It's always addressed if my people, if you will, if they will. It's never if God will. There are no ifs in God's plan. The only if is dependent on us. You get anything so far? So my thing that I've been praying about and that really struck me is if wisdom, answered prayers, salvation, promises, all of these things, if these are conditional, then what makes us think that a fresh move, a revival from God is not also conditional? Before I get any further, I want to pray. I want you to stretch your hands this way and ask God to use me. Father, I thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these people. I pray you open their hearts and open their minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we begin to talk about revival, there's one scripture that always comes to mind. There's one scripture I have heard for years when we start to talk about the term revival. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. God was speaking to King Solomon, and he said, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal 
their land. Once again, we see another if-then statement from God. We see God once again presenting an if my people will do X, Y, Z, then I will move. He said, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from wicked ways, then. And so often, I know that in the past two years, I am not looking forward to election year this year. God, please help us. I am not ready to hear all the garbage they're about to throw us from CNN and Fox News. I'm going to shut down Facebook for at least till after the election's over. Amen. But I know when the last election was coming that this scripture was just full. It was, I mean, I, there was not anybody I did not see on my Facebook feed that was not posting 2 Chronicles 7 14, 2 Chronicles 7 14. And it's always addressed, this scripture is always addressed to sinners and to pagan nations and to unsaved people. But that's not who God addressed the statement to. He said, if my people. He did not say, if Persia. If Egypt, if the Canaanites, if the foreigners, if he said, if my people. Of course, we know in the scripture he's talking to the Israelites, but as we're saved in the Bible, we're grafted into the family of God, so we are also God's people. So God is saying, if my people, if those who are called by my name will be will, will put into action, then I will move. See, it's God's people that were called to action. Not the sinners, not the politicians, not the institutions, not the government. It was God's people. But we're seeing now, and I got a little preach on this one, so y'all just bear with me. We're seeing now the church people blaming it on the politicians. If it's not the Republicans' fault, it's the Democrats' fault. If it's not Donald Trump's fault, it's Obama's fault. If it's not Obama's fault, it was George Bush's fault. If it's not somebody else's fault, it's not ours. But who else did God entrust the message of salvation to? Who else did he say, did, did Jesus send out his disciples? He didn't send out the unsaved ones. He sent out those who walked with him and who were filled with the Holy Ghost. And he said, go ye into all the world. But we want to blame on everybody else. We want to blame on the principals, on the educators, everybody else but the church. Can I tell you that the reason that true revival has yet to spark is because God's people have yet to take action? The reason why revival has tarried for so long is because God's people have been satisfied Walking into their church building, listening to two or three songs, sitting down, listening to a 45 minute message with a 10 minute altar call, going home, eating Popeyes and churches, taking a nap, and going from Monday to Saturday. <laughs> Nothing else changed. Amen. Revival has tarried because of God's people, nobody else. The blame is on us. It's interesting that God addressed the statement to my people. Why? Because revival hinges on the actions and responses of God's people. The spark of revival hinges on you and on me. Revival is nobody else's duty but ours. It's nobody else's fault that it has not occurred but ours. See, many Christians in our churches today are those as Isaiah would talk about in Isaiah 29 13. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Many of our churches today are like the church in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, the church of Sardis. The Lord spoke to them through the apostle John and said, You have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. People say the church in Sardis is lively. They got all these programs. They got a hopping youth group. They got all the modern stuff. They got them lights that flicker. They got all these outreach programs. But they're not seeing any salvations. They're not seeing anybody come in and take the drugs and leave them delivered. They got all this stuff that makes 
makes them look lively, but they're just like what Jesus told the Pharisees. You are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but inside you are full of dead men's bones. Many of our modern churches today are what revivalists would call dead churches. And now when we think of the term dead church, we think, well, that means they got dry preachers. They, they got dry worship. They don't have any people in it. It's a small church. They don't have nobody. I have been in churches that run over 2,000 people, and I felt like I was in a graveyard. And I've been in churches with 12 to 15 where I thought, dear God, I'm about to get right into the river. This is going to sweep me away. Numbers have nothing to do with it, folks. Leonard, Leonard Ravenhill, in his book, My Revival Terry, says, when there is no passion, the church suffers even if it be filled to its doors. The reason why revival has carried is because we have no desire and we have no passion. We have no desire to put ourselves aside. We have no desire to think about the benefit of the body, the benefit of, of the church, the benefit of us giving something up. We're all about me, 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 me. We've lost our passion. We've lost our focus. We've lost our desire. When you define a dead church, a dead church is one that is devoid of the power and presence of God. It is a place that many gather for fellowship but not worship. It is a place that a sinner can enter in and feel no conviction. It is a place that those in bondage can leave the same way they came in. It is a place where many programs are promoted, but spiritual power is demoted. It is a place where people are found playing more than they are praying. The only noticeable difference between a dead church and a cemetery is its members are still physically breathing. And when we talk about dead churches, we want to blame it on the leadership. We want to blame it on, 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 on again, on somebody else. But spiritual death does not just happen overnight. Physically, we die instant, instantly. When it's time, time to go, we go. But spiritual death happens little by little. Spiritual death is that death that happens because of compromising decisions that eventually led to spiritual dryness and complete just elimination. Compromises that made a once vibrant relationship with Christ erode. And become of no effect. See, spiritual death is a result, it's not a cause. Spiritual death was a result of, well, one Sunday won't hurt if I miss. Well, you know, I went two Sundays in a row, I'm a little tired this morning. I think I'm just going to have some leisure time and they'll do some of my heart. Hello. I'll catch up on my Bible and my reading and my praying later on. I, my, my show's on. And then we wonder why we're so spiritually disconnected. Hello. Y'all right there? We want to we wanna make all these compromising decisions. And then when something happens, we get all fretful. Oh, God. And we wonder why we feel so defeated. And why God feels so distant because you've not been communing with him. It's because we say, God, you're not as important as this. I'm going to turn this way so nobody thinks I'm talking to them. God, you're not as important as my kids' sport club. God, you're not as important as my show that I need to catch up on. God, you're not as important as me catching up on my sleep. God, you're not as important as me going on the second or third vacation and missing the 15th Sunday of the year. <clears throat> the problem is God's people have decided God no longer holds the highest position in their life. Their own pleasures do. Now, I'm not telling you that sports and hobbies and leisure time are of the devil. No, you need that. But when that takes precedence more than coming to God's house and getting in prayer and, and giving your time, then it becomes a problem. No longer is 
is it a hobby? It's a god. No longer is it just a leisure TV show. It's an idol. And God will share his glory with no man. If you look throughout the book of Judges, the reason why the Israelites went through so many hardships is because they would repent and God would restore them and give them a judge to deliver them. But then it said they'd go right back to their own ways and God would depart. And they'd been good for a little while and something bad would happen. And then, oh God, we'd sing again. And thankfully, he was always merciful. But do you not realize that God gets a little sick and tired of unstable Christians? He loves us, but I think sometimes he's like Daddy in heaven saying, can you not grasp this? Is it not clear enough? We've lost our passion and our desire for God. We've decided that God is no longer the sole focus of our love, but everything else is. See, the church is dead by the people's choice. Church people have chosen personal pleasures and comfort over God. Many Christians have become too earthly minded that they are no heavenly good. They have traded their passion for God, for passion, for hobbies, and for other things. Lost passion and desire for God is the number one cause of spiritual death. Our church in general, Christians in general, have lost the zeal for the Lord. I know, and Brother Farley, Brother Gene, Papa, y'all will probably remember this. Brother and Sister Myrtle, you'll remember this too. The church 50 years ago, you know where they were on Friday and Saturday nights? Right here in this altar prayer. You know where the church would have been 50 years ago on a Sunday night? Right here having church, whether it was five or fifty. But long gone in those days, you see. Long gone are the days where we'll go pray for two and three hours until we get a touch from God. Long gone are the days where we'll walk down an altar and we'll have people tearing with us for however long it takes until we get a breakthrough. Long gone are those days that we push ourselves back from the dinner table and say, no, I'm not going to eat tonight. I feel like I need a word from God. And you go lock yourself up somewhere and you start reading the word and start praying and you stay up however long it takes to get the word you know you need from God. Long gone are those days and we wonder why we feel so stuck. Long gone are the days where we say it's not what I want, but what he wants. We've lost our zeal. We've lost our passion. Revival has tarried because we have no passion. Revival has tarried because we say we want revival, but we don't put in the work to get it. Revival has tarried because of you and me. So the first condition of revival, if you're taking notes, the first condition is a renewal of passion and desire. See, when we talk about revival, we always talk about, especially in the Pentecostal realm, we always talk about revival as it relates to charismatic manifestations. If somebody's running up and down the aisles, oh, they're having revival. If somebody's over there laid out in the floor speaking in tongues, oh, they're having revival. If they got a fire and brimstone preacher that loses his voice after preaching for 15 minutes, oh, they're having revival. If they've got the hyped up music that's shaking the walls and the neighbors are complaining, then they're having revival. But that's not what revival is. The true meaning of revival means an awakening. It's a stirring. It's a resurrection of what was dead. I preached on it four or five, maybe, I don't remember how many Sundays ago, on Ezekiel 37 when Ezekiel prophesied to the valley of dry bones and they said they became an exceedingly great army and then the breath of the spirit came upon them, and then they were able to become who God had determined them to be. That's what revival is. It's taking what was dead, stirring it up, putting it back together and putting the breath of the spirit in it and giving it power to live and operate under the law and under the promises of God. 
And what's interesting is we always think revival is just an outward manifestation, but revival is inward before it is outward. Look at your neighbor and tell them revival starts with me. Look at somebody and tell them revival starts with me. Murder revival starts with me. Grave revival starts with me. Nisi revival starts with me. How pleased would you as a church be if you were to find out that Monday through Saturday, me as your pastor, I don't pray, I don't read the scriptures, I don't study, I just put something together and I get up and preach and that's it. How satisfied would you really be? If you wouldn't be satisfied with me doing that, then why are you satisfied with yourself doing that? If you wouldn't be satisfied with me not putting in the effort to bring a message from God, then why are you satisfied not putting any work in and showing up on Sunday expecting me to carry the load? Revival is inward before it is out. Revival starts when I choose to stop looking at everybody else and I start taking inventory of my own life. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourselves. Test yourself and determine if you are of the faith. The word examine and the word test are related. Both of them mean to put yourself on trial. It means to put yourself up in the witness stand and to question yourself according to the word of God exactly how accurate is your life in parallel to the Bible. If you were to be put on trial by God himself, would you meet the standard? That's what 2 Corinthians is saying. Examine yourself. Test yourself. So it begs us asking our, our own question. Am I the one who's spiritually disconnected? Not everybody else, is it me? Am I living a pure and righteous lifestyle before God? Am I praying like I should be? Am I giving like I should be? Is there unrepentant sin in my life? Is there bondage that I need to give up in my life? Is there spiritual compromise in my life? Forget everybody else. You cannot determine their decision. I cannot determine the decision that Myrtle makes or Rhonda makes or Holly makes. I can only determine my own actions. It's up to me. Revival starts with me. Quit looking at everybody else and start looking within yourself. Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Is my passion what it's supposed to be? Is my desire where it's supposed to be in order for me to see the move of God that I need? We get so focused on seeing revival in the church when we need to focus first on revival in our own lives and in our families. stated too often we hide ourselves lest the sight of ourselves should sicken ourselves but like blind Bartimaeus we must pray for sight upward, inward, and outward inward so we will see ourselves in our need for cleansing and power too often we're hard on everybody else but even on ourselves we will judge everybody else but make excuses for our own fault but folks, it's time that we start making efforts and stop making excuses. If God says it's sin, it's sin, no matter how you feel about it. <clears throat> if God says it is filthy in his sight, it's filthy, no matter how you try to dress it up. You cannot put a pig on a flag with dressing and calling it her. It's sin if it's sin. It's time that we start looking within and quit pointing at everybody else. Well, Sister So-and-so did, uh-uh. What is great doing? Well, Brother So-and-so, uh-uh. What effort is great putting in? Can I tell you that why, I, why you think I'm pointing the finger at you, I'm not. I'm not trying to browbeat you. Because I will tell you I have been under such spiritual discipline this past week that it has been almost miserable. 
Because God has revealed to me as I've written this sermon things that I myself have come short of. He's revealed to me that this is not up to his standard. That this needs to be more and this over here needs to be less. He's not, I've not come this morning to beat you to death and then send you out of here just weeping and crying. I've come to tell you that God is calling us as individuals and as a body to finally get back to him. It's time that we stop living like the world. It's time that we stop just doing our own thing and we start living the way God would have us to live. It's time that we start taking inventory and changing ourselves instead of focusing on everybody else. Revival starts with me. Misty, I'm almost done whenever you're ready. Only when we have thoroughly examined ourselves and allowed God to search us and cleanse us from anything taking his place can we begin to experience personal revival. Personal revival is an essential element of the condition of awakening. Personal revival is the essential element of the condition of awakening. Only when I regain my passion will I begin to see individuals saved. Only when I regain my desire to see more of God will I begin to see the miracles, the signs, and the wonders that I have prayed for. Only when I begin to hunger and thirst for more of God will I be filled by Him. And folks, revival needs hungry and thirsty souls. If you're satisfied where you are right now, then you don't want revival, no matter how much you may tell me you do. Revival starts when you decide, I am no longer satisfied with where I am right now. Revival starts when I say, I'm tired of my prayer life being mediocre. I'm tired of my worship being substandard. I'm tired of not living in the plan that God has for me. I'm ready to move forward. I'm ready to go higher. Only when God's people desire revival will it come.